Namaste, Satishji. How are you? I hope you're doing well. I'm very well. Thank you. Um, just to introduce you to uh, everybody who's listening today and following Ahimsa and the environment, um, Satish Kumar is one of my heroes and uh, really uh, an inspiring person to everybody at Go Dharmic and the whole idea of Dharma being love and compassion and kindness for all and us being responsible human beings. Um, your work on the environment and the fact that you walked, uh, what is it, 8,000 miles um, to promote nonviolence and to speak up against nuclear proliferation. At that time, also meeting uh, Dr. Martin Luther King um, and so many wonderful people along the journey is really inspiring. And uh, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for speaking with me today and for sharing your messages with people around the world through this event and through this platform um, as uh, a great ambassador for the idea of Dharma and Ahimsa in the world today, which I think we so greatly and badly need to remember, recall and practice. Uh, so I just want to uh, take that moment to say thank you for everything that you have done and for, for being here with us today. Thank you very much for your very kind words and kind uh, introduction. It's my pleasure to be on your program. Thank you. And so as our event is called Ahimsa and the Environment, uh, I think it's prudent to ask, what do you mean by Ahimsa? What, what, what does the term mean to you? <clears throat> you know, we are facing grave crisis at this moment. Our environment is in great peril. The climate change is one of the big issue and whole world is worried about climate change. But they don't understand the why we have climate catastrophe, climate crisis. We have it because we have been very violent to nature. We have been violent to the forests. We have been violent to the oceans. We have been violent to the soil. We have been violent to animals. And the consequence of our violent behavior is climate change. So at the moment, many people are trying to find solution through technology. They are trying to find solution for renewable energy, they are trying to find solution through nuclear energy. They are trying to find some other solutions, but no solution will be enough unless we reduce our violence to nature and we start to practice non-violence to nature. That is the main uh, message that I want to give to the world that ahimsa or non-violence is a many levels. It has many levels. First of all, we have to be non-violent to ourselves. Quite often, people are violent to themselves. Then we have to be non-violent to other people. Whatever your religion, whatever your nationality, whatever your politics, whatever your system of governance, we have to practice non-violence in our relationship with all nations, all religions, all races, all colors, all people are one human family. And then we have to be nonviolent to nature, to nonviolent to animals, nonviolent to, uh, to forests and to oceans and to the atmosphere. Unless we practice nonviolence at all these three levels, we cannot solve the problem of uh, environmental catastrophe and, and environmental catastrophe and biodiversity diminishing and all our, um, our natural world is in difficult time. So nonviolence has to be brought into this debate in a very active way. Thank you, that's really uh, a beautiful description. And, and what would you say to a person who doesn't understand today uh, what ahimsa means? How can they, from a personal perspective, 
start to practice nonviolence in their life? What kind of things could they do uh, for a modern young person, perhaps a young professional trying to find their way in the world today, just coming into the world of work through education and so on? What would be your message to that young person who is uh, the custodian of the future growth of the planet now, uh, seeing as you know older generations now move on? What, what would your message be to those young people? My message is very simple. Uh, <clears throat> why we have environmental crisis, and at the moment, young people are waking up, actually. I have a great hope from young people, people like Greta Thunberg in Sweden, and hundreds of thousands of young people around the world, in America, in Europe, in India, in China, in Australia, in Africa, in every continent, young people are waking up. So my message to young people is that, first of all, I congratulate you. And I say, well done. The future generation will remember you that these young people have pioneered the new way of life. But I want to say to you that nonviolence is fundamental principle because at the moment we have problems of environment due to our waste and our pollution. So create an economic system or a production system which has no waste and no pollution. Waste is violence. Pollution is violence. Actually, waste and pollution are sins against nature. Waste and pollution are crime against nature. So if young people can focus on this, that whatever I do, as long as there is no waste and no pollution, then it is nonviolent way of production and consumption. If there's any waste and any pollution, there's a violence to nature. That is the young people have to create a new kind of economy. The older generation has created economy which is wasteful and which is polluting. And so young people have to create a new kind of economy. And so we also need a new kind of education. At the moment, the schools and colleges and universities are training young people to go in the industry in the same old way. The educational system we have today was designed right. for the uh, 19th and 20th century when economic growth was the uh, dominant paradigm. But now we are living in the age of ecology, the age of environment. And our educational system has to become more nature-centered, eco-centered, rather than ego-centered. At the moment, our educational system is very ego-centered, egotistical. Always I, when children and young people leave universities, they are saying, I want to be successful. I want to get big job. I want to earn lots of money. I want to own a big house. I want to have a high position, power, control, prestige, status for me, me, me. So our educational system is based in me culture. I would like to change that education and I would like to see moving from me culture to we culture. It's all right. of us together in this planet Earth and how we live in harmony with ourselves and in harmony with nature. That is our project. And in harmony with nature and harmony with people, if we live, then we will be fine. We will be better off. And so everybody's interested, interrelated, interconnected. No one person can be successful uh, and be happy and an environment be sustained. It cannot be done. This is why we have problems of injustice and environmental problems. So, so this is my message to young people. Create a new economic system, which is non-violent, non-violent economy, non-violent relationship with nature and production <laughs> consumption without pollution and without waste. So cyclical, sustainable, uh, which doesn't create the same level of waste. And I think you spoke about it a lot in your book, Soil, 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 Soul and Society. Uh, the, the soil and the society is there, but where does the soul come into that? Like, what, how, is this a different level of consciousness that we're talking about yeah, uh, for yeah. people to understand? The soul is ourselves, our personal being. So 
when we have a relationship with other people and relationship with nature, that has to be soulful, meaning that that has to come from love and compassion. Mm -hmm. That is quality of the soul. So when people are acting for the environment, you can act out of anger, out of fear, out of anxiety. That is not soul quality. That's the quality of the mind. Because of our mental exercise, we are becoming angry and we are becoming anxious and we are becoming fearful and we are becoming untrusting. And so if you bring that to your soul and your heart and your spirit, then you can develop kindness and compassion. So I would say act for the environment, but act not out of anger, but out of love. If you act out of love, that's a soul quality. If you act out of anger, that's a kind of uh, intellectual or mental quality. Our mind creates anger and fear and anxiety, but our heart and our soul and our spirit creates love, compassion, kindness, and courage. So you, if you want to cultivate soul, you have to be courageous. And in order to trust other people, you have to be courageous. Nonviolence is not for the coward. Nonviolence is not for the uh, faint heart. Nonviolence is a way of the courageous, of the, of the brave. And so if you can see the examples of people who have practiced nonviolence, like Mahatma Gandhi, he was a brave man. Martin Luther King, you mentioned, it was my great privilege and, and, a, and a great pleasure and great honor to meet Martin Luther King. And he was an embodiment of nonviolence. He was an embodiment of love. He acted out of love. He was against the racism, but he did not hate anybody. He did not hate white people. Mahatma Gandhi was against colonialism and imperialism and industrialism but he did not hate white people. He said, British people can stay in England as my brothers and sisters, but not as my rulers. And so being against colonialism, imperialism, racism, sexism is good, but being a, a, hating anybody is not good. So that is the kind of uh, uh, nonviolence uh, on a very large scale we practice, and that nonviolence becomes a soul quality. So without soul, without spirit, Without that consciousness, we cannot just act um, in soil and in society. Soil and society are the outer world, and the soul is the inner world. Without inner, outer is not enough. And without outer, inner is not enough. The inner and the outer are interconnected. But at the moment, people only focus on the outer, only focus on the outer environment, only focus on the uh, social environment, they don't focus on the spiritual environment. So I would like to bring um, a social environment, an ecological and, and a natural environment, and the spiritual environment together. That's a greater holistic environmental movement. That really makes sense to me. And I think it's foundational that uh, um, a community based on the heart has the chance of connecting people together for a sustainable and shared future, as opposed to a community of ego or self-centeredness, which cannot have the sustainability. And I think Martin Luther King used the term, the beloved community, uh, not as a particular faith community, but as a community of love and people that we would all come together from different backgrounds and places on, on the earth to sustain and care for each other. What would he, uh, you, you met him at that time. What did he say to you then uh, about uh, nonviolence? And what do you think he would say today about the environment if he was with us today? Uh, he was already speaking about the environment in 1962 and 63 and 64. And when I met him, he was also saying that the, uh, the environment is not only um, social issues. Environment also means natural environment. And so he was already concerned with how humans behave towards nature and, 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 and protecting our forest and, and being kind and compassionate to animals and, and, and not polluting our oceans. And, and, and all those things are already 
um, very much present in Martin Luther King's um, life and, and his talks. But he focused more on racial justice because he said, um, in this day and age, in, in the 20th century, we are not treating human beings as human beings. We are still treating mm. them as slaves or as second class. Uh, so this has to be um, changed. We cannot treat any human being as second class citizen. All human beings have a dignity of life. If we do not give every human being the dignity of life, then we are not a proper civilization. How can you have a civilization where one human being treats other human being in a discriminatory way? That is not a symbol of civilization. And we call ourselves America and Europe as a civilized society. And how you treat human beings in a such a way that they may uncivilized. So that was his main concern that we need to give dignity to all living beings, never mind what is their religion, what is their nationality, what is their color, what is their gender, uh, what is their economic status. These are all secondary. The primary thing is dignity of human life, equal dignity to all human beings. That was his message to me when I talked to him. And uh, so uh, we've spoken about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, and also about Mahatma Gandhi, who I believe uh, very early uh, practiced uh, experiments with fruitarianism and diets and reducing harm through diet and environmentalism. He was a, a very strong believer in the care of the environment. Uh, what would you say about Mahatma Gandhi and his legacy of nonviolence? Uh, which is today remembered predominantly by the world for his political action, but in terms of his environmental message and uh, in terms of sustainable culture, uh, whether it's self-production, self-rule, self, self uh, uh, rule, as it were, that he used to, uh, the Swaraj uh, that he used to uh, discuss. What, what would you say about that in the environment of locality? Mahatma Gandhi, even in the uh, 30s and 40s, was aware that the industrial civilization is causing tremendous harm to nature and to environment. He used to say there is enough in the world for everybody's need, but not enough for anybody's greed. Right. And, and, and he said even in 1920s and 30s and 40s that our human uh, civilization and our industrial civilization is very much greed-based and not need-based. So we need to shift from greed to need because if you have a greed, even small number of people cannot satisfy their greed and they can create havoc in the world. So change from greed to need, that was his message. And he also start, wanted to say that everybody should start with themselves. Your, your transformation begins with yourself. You cannot ask other people to change without you changing yourself. You have to practice what you preach. And therefore he used to say, the be the change that you want to see in the world. And that was his great message. And so he wanted uh, Swaraj and Swadeshi. Those were the two words, means self-rule and local economy. Because when you have a local economy that is small scale, human scale, arts and crafts, and, and, and more decentralized and more local and more cyclical so that whatever you take from nature goes back to nature. You use nothing which is, uh, uh, which is not reabsorbable and recyclable back into nature. But the economy of nature has no waste and no pollution and no centralization. Economy of nature is a perfect example for us. Nature is the greatest teacher for Mahatma Gandhi. And also similar to Mahatma Gandhi was Rabindranath Tagore. They lived at this more or less same time. And Tagore used to say the same thing. He used to say that we have to learn from nature. Nature is our teacher. He started a school called Shanti Niketan. And in the school, he will have his classes under the mango trees or, or, or neem trees. And he will say that you have two teachers. One is me your human teacher. And the other is tree, our teacher. Look at the mango tree. The mangoes are always given to us as a gift. 
and there's no waste. Everything can go back into nature. So Mahatma Gandhi and Rabindranath Tagore, these were the two prime examples of people working and practicing non-violence in their daily life. So I would say that if world had followed the ways of Mahatma Gandhi, there'll be no climate uh, crisis. If India had followed the way of Mahatma Gandhi, there'd be no pollution, no waste, and no um, uh, uh, climate catastrophe that we face today. At the moment, we are facing climate crisis because of the centralized mass production and mass consumption. And mass production, mass consumption is very wasteful. And this is why we need to go back to a very simple life, elegant simplicity. That's another book I have written for elegant simplicity. We have to live simple life in material terms so that we can live rich life in non-material terms. So we can develop arts, poetry, music, painting, gardening, cooking, family, friendship, uh, relationship, uh, and dharma. All these things are unlimited. There is no limit. You cannot have a limit to poetry and music and dancing and singing and friendship and, and gardening and cooking. Those are uh, non-violent way. And, and our material needs, what, take we, what we take from nature should be only what we really need for our survival and not see money as a matter of status and a position and a power and a control. Money should be only a means to exchange things, means to an end, not the end in itself. At the moment, the money has become the end and human beings have become the means to make more money. And nature has become a means to make more money. So that is what Mahatma Gandhi wanted to change. And uh, one of his contemporaries who I know deeply inspired you, uh, as well as uh, um, our work at Godarmic, Vinoba Bhave, um, was also you know, a wonderful uh, ambassador for the idea of nonviolence in the way that he lived and the message that um, anything can be done, like he can move mountains with that will and that desire to try and find a solution. I see that same spirit in you. We've tried our best to kind of have that energy and positivity uh, with our work as well. This environmental challenge and um, the, the danger that threatens us can become very depressing and overwhelming and fear-based for many people. Um, how does one approach this catastrophe with love uh, and in a way that we do not create more negative emotion, negative karma in the space? And how, how can we move mountains and really achieve the uh, seemingly unachievable uh, uh, challenge that uh, Faces us. I, I mean, you mentioned Vinoba Bhave. He is in the same tradition as Rabindranath Tagore and uh, Mahatma Gandhi in India. And he showed that how you can move mountains and how you can, as move mountains, you can move hearts and the minds of people through compassion. And so he, particularly, he showed uh, a, a kind of through compassion and nonviolence. You can even bring political change and social change and, and land reform. He walked more than 10 years, over 100,000 miles all over India, north, south, east, west, center of India, 100,000 miles over 10 years. And he went from village to village asking landlords to give land for the poor. He said, don't wait for the uh, um, radical revolutionaries uh, who come with arms and kill you before you give your donation. Don't wait until government changes the law and enforces the land reform. Do it voluntarily. That is a much superior and nonviolent way than imposition from the government or imposition from the armed revolutionaries. And so Vinoba um, Bhave appealed to the hearts and the souls of people. And he managed to get 4 million acres of land in donations. Can you imagine in India, 
that he could collect four million acres of land. And he distributed that land to the poorest of the poor, wretched of the wretched, uh, lowest of the low people who were Harijans, who were Dalits, who were uh, untouchables, who were outcasts. And he said, we have to give, like Martin Luther King, he, Vinoba Bhave said the same thing. We have to give dignity to all living beings and dignity to all human beings. And how can you treat any human being as a Dalit or as untouchable or as a Harijan? They are human beings. So we have to go beyond this caste discrimination and, and a caste, uh, um, caste uh, um, putting caste down. So he um, distributed that land among hundreds of thousands of people, and now they are much better off. So that is an example of a social revolution brought about by complete and utter nonviolence. And so these are great inspiration to me. And I was also very privileged to be a disciple of Vinoba Bhave. I walked with him through Kerala, uh, through um, uh, Mysore, uh, uh, Karnataka, and through Rajasthan, and in Gujarat, and in many, many uh, uh, states of India. I walked with him, and I learned from him. And he was not only a land reformer, and a non-violent radical revolutionary, um, but non-violent, of course, uh, but also he was a great teacher uh, of, of, of Upanishad and Bhagavad Gita. And, um, and he was a great scholar of Arabic, and he taught me about Quran, and he was a great scholar of uh, Christianity, and he taught me about the Bible. And so he was not only a, a social reformer, but he was also a great scholar. I'm greatly um, uh, influenced by his teaching and by his time and life on me. And that's uh, amazing. And, you know, we feel, uh, I feel blessed that to be listening from you uh, about your experiences with him and it shines through when you talk about it. And one book that I really love was this talks on the Gita, uh, yeah. which he spoke about when he was in the, uh, in the jail. Uh, the 18 sessions that he taught and he spoke and you know he started by saying i live in the air of the gita um and i think it comes back to that soil soul and society that you mentioned that that he lives within a, a, in a state of consciousness which is one with others one with the earth one with other living beings one with animals one with uh other people actually and, um, you that I'm so glad, Hanuman, that you mentioned Bhagavad Gita and the talks on the Gita. Actually, my book, Soil, Soul, and Society, is influenced by Bhagavad Gita. Uh, in Bhagavad Gita, there are three words, yagna, dana, and tapas. Those three words I translate as caring for the soil, caring for soul, and caring for society. Because yagna means our relationship with natural world. And we replenish. When we use nature, we replenish it. That is the most fundamental and ultimate principle of ecology. That if you take one tree for your house, plant five trees, that's a yagna. So yagna is to replenish our, whatever we take from nature back and replenish nature. So that's a yagna. And without, and for, in order to do yagna, we have to work with our own hands. We have to garden, we have to, we have to uh, plant trees, we have to uh, build houses. All that is done as a spiritual practice. That's a yagna. And that I call it soil, caring for the soil. Because soil is life. We are all made of soil. Uh, our body is made of soil. All our food is soil. All our houses, the wood and, and bricks we built with are soil. Uh, everything is soil. So nature is soil. <laughs> so I call um, uh, taking care of soil is yagna. And then um, uh, dana is taking care of society. Everything in the gift economy. Every, we have received so much from our ancestors as a gift. But now it is our duty to give back something to our future generations. So uh, if I build a house, that's a gift to the world. If I write a book, that's a gift to the world. If I, um, I uh, sing a song, that is a gift to the world. Whatever I do, I do it with the sense of gift. That's a dana, gift. Whatever you act, 
make it as an offering, Anjali, Dana, offering. So that's a, that's a uh, society. And the soul is tapas. So whatever, we, we have to replenish ourselves because we use our intellect, we use our language, we use ourselves. So we have to replenish uh, by silence, by, uh, by vegetation, by, uh, uh, um, uh, by many, many things that we can practice, spiritual practice. So spiritual, all kinds of spiritual practices are tapas. And so yagna, dana, tapas. These are the three principles of Bhagavad Gita, which is are in talks on the Gita, what you have there. And that is what inspired me to write Soil Soul Society. That's amazing. I have both of the books here with me. They're the two books that I brought with me to, uh, to speak with you. So that, that's uh, uh, really uh, amazing. And, uh, and what would you say to people who are living around the cities? who don't have much touch with nature at all. You know, we don't have many green spaces around us anymore, or our children don't know, you know, where food comes from. They've never grown anything themselves. Uh, the only green space is a, a small football pitch that they might see uh, where they play or something. They're not in touch with nature as previous generations may have been, uh, particularly before the 70s and really kind of dense uh, population growth as well as, uh, urbanization of uh, towns and cities how can one become more in touch with nature uh, from a young age and and what what should we do uh, to try and uh, connect with nature more personally i would like to see every school all over the world every college and every university being associated with the farm because if children study two or three days in a school, in a classroom, and the two or three days out in nature, on the farm, working, growing food, planting trees, uh, walking in nature, um, all that uh, um, uh, watering plants, everything what we do, every school, every university should have that association with a farm. Even in the cities, I would like to see all the roofs of the cities having garden on the roof garden. You know, only you need about one or one and a half foot of soil on the top of the uh, roof to grow uh, mint and, and rosemary and thyme and tomatoes and, and a cucumber and, and, and many, many other vegetables you can grow on your roof. So every roof should be turned into a garden. Even on the walls of the city uh, houses, you can grow vegetables what you call vertical garden. So you don't have to send nature into exile out of the city. Nature can be brought back in the city. And our city should have squires and gardens. And in the gardens, we should have everything, fruit, flower, herbs, vegetables, everything should be in the garden. Garden should not be only ornamental. Garden should have a variety. And that includes vegetables and herbs and fruit and flowers. So if we can have that in gardens, uh, and London is 48% is green. And, and we have a Richmond Park, and we have a Hampstead Heat, and we have a Regent's Park, and we have a Hyde Park, and we have Green Park, and we have so many parks. But those parks are just ornamental, just grass um, and lawns. I think that lawn is like a green desert. I don't like lawns. I would like to see fruits, flowers, vegetables, herbs, trees. All these things should be in the city. And the city should have squires, but the squires should be beautifully um, with water and fountains and, and flowers and trees so that children can come and play in the squire and, and, and traffic free. So we can redesign our cities and we don't have to make uh, our cities into concrete jungles. They can be uh, living cities. They can be uh, ecological cities. So I'm not thinking that cities right. should be an impediment to environmentalism. Uh, cities should be a kind of green deserts or green uh, concrete jungles. Cities can also be transformed into beautiful green uh, places to live and people can enjoy good life. So let all children and all young people be connected with nature. Uh, otherwise, children fear nature. They don't know how, what nature is. They don't know how to grow food. They don't know how, they don't know the names of uh, the fruit and vegetables and, and trees. 
So uh, we are, our children are suffering from nature deficit disorder. <laughs> we need to we need to bring nature back into schools and uh, children's life so that they can be free of nature deficit disorder. That's nice. <laughs> and uh, what would you say around? Uh, I mean, one of the really concerning things is the, the loss of biodiversity on the planet. Since if we consider that fifty percent of the animals of the world are now extinct just in the last fifty years. It's a horrifying fact to hear about the uh, amount of animals that are facing extinction uh, in the near future. Uh, how are we treating um, you know, the vast biodiversity? Uh, and and what is your view on that? It, it is a violence, right? Like we, it's a great violence that we're committing uh, uh, to lose such biodiversity that many animals, uh, many uh, future generations won't even know existed. The biodiversity is diminishing because humanity has come to believe that human species are superior to all other species. And therefore, we have the right to use all other species for our benefit, and particularly the industrial system. And so we have been encroaching and impinging more and more and more wild places and wildlife and wild habitat. So we have to change our way of thinking. We have to think that human beings are not superior to nature. Human beings are nature. There is no difference, there's no separation between nature and humans. Humans are as much nature as mountains and forests and animals and birds and insects and water. We are made of earth, air, fire, water time and space and consciousness. And all living beings are made of earth, air, fire, water, space, time, and consciousness. And therefore, we all have uh, equal rights. We honor human rights, of course, but we also honor rights of nature. Forests have right to survive and live happily. Animals have rights, oceans have rights, rivers have rights, all living beings have rights, but we humans have somehow reserved human rights for ourselves. And we think that no other species have any right to live. They are there only for our use. We can kill them, we can eat them, we can uh, you know, cut, the, uh, uh, cut down the forest uh, to make more farms. And 30 to 40% of food is wasted. We are producing so much food to make profit and money but 30 to 40% of food is wasted. And lots of food we are using to turn into biofuel. And we are turning lots of our food like potatoes and, and a corn into plastic. That's a waste. So on the one hand, we are diminishing biodiversity and turning that land which we produce food into plastic and into biofuel. What is madness? So I would say we need to understand the intrinsic value of all life and not think that human beings have right to impinge and encroach and destroy and use other lives just for our interest and our profit and our consumption and our production and our um, uh, economic growth. If we can have that new awareness and new consciousness, then I think biodiversity can be protected. And in terms of um, meat consumption for, for, diet, for diets around the world, especially particularly the Western diet, so heavily based on meat consumption, I, I think you know, meat in the past in Asian diets across Asia was a small part for the, for the communities that did consume meat and it was largely vegetable driven. But here it seems uh, that many people will consume animal products at every meal, at every opportunity in such high quantities, although there's a movement now in this, this last decade of plant-based culture, of veganism, or I can see a lot of energy around uh, and a, uh, an economy that's growing around uh, plant-based diets. Um, what would you say to somebody who's consuming uh, animal products today and, and how would you convince them to consider a path, uh, a, a more non-violent path for the environment? 
You know, I come from the Jain community, Jain tradition. And our Jain tradition from 2,600 years ago, the vegetarianism started. And also Buddhist tradition had the vegetarian tradition. And so we have always considered that uh, you don't need meat for protein. And I have, my family has been vegetarian for 1,600 years. And I'm 85 years old. Is there any lack of energy I have? <laughs> Somebody asked me in a school, which is your favorite animal? I said, an elephant. And the child asked me, why? I said, look, elephant is a vegetarian. And still it gets so big and so strong. So you don't need to eat meat to be big and strong. Then the child asked me, what is your second favorite animal? I said, a horse. Why? Horse is again vegetarian and has so much horsepower. So I think this idea that we need meat for our health and for our energy and we need protein is completely mis misguided. And 25% and of greenhouse gases come from uh, meat farming. And a huge amount of water is needed. Huge amount of um, chemicals are needed. Huge amount of uh, um, uh, greenhouse gases are produced uh, by animals. And therefore, uh, I think we have to increase plant-based diet as much as we can. That, that should be an, an important part of our um, climate action, that we need to reduce, if not altogether, eliminate uh, meat eating. And, and if, we, if those who are eating meat eat less, and, and if you are eating meat, which I would advise not to eat, but if you do, only organic and free range and occasionally, maybe once a week or twice a week, no more. And cultivate like in, I was in Italy recently. I was invited by the Vatican. I went for a conference. I had a great privilege of meeting the Pope Francis himself. <clears throat> and, and the uh, meeting was co-sponsored by the British Embassy and the Italian Embassy uh, to the Holy See. And I was invited for dinner at the British Embassy in Rome, grand building, a wonderful garden, and there were about 100 uh, guests uh, for the dinner. And I was deeply impressed, inspired, and, and touched by uh, the dinner served there, but all vegetarian. Can you imagine British ambassador giving dinner to prestigious guests around the world, uh, representing all religions and scientists and the um, president of the COP26, Alok Sharma, and the, uh, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, all there. And we are all completely 100% vegetarian dinner. That if a British embassy in Rome can do it, everybody can do it. So I think, yeah. I think reducing meat consumption is an imperative for our time in order to address the climate change. And I'm so pleased to, pleased to hear you say that. And through uh, my working career, I've attended hundreds of conferences where food was a big struggle, where you know it was steak dinners or it was uh, non-vegetarian meals and not much uh, vegetarian option. And, and to hear you know, at these high events that now they are changing and people do consider a vegetarian path or a vegan path to be the uh, uh, more conscious solution for, for consumption. I think that is a, absolutely a wonderful thing today to, to, to see happening, the change before us, and we need more of it. And I hope that COP26, this event um, that's happening, will stand more for that because I don't think still animal uh, uh, consumption is discussed enough. It's still very much transport. It's very much technology. It's very much solutionizing, but not reducing harm, reducing violence uh, in the current time, in the now. Yes, absolutely. In this Vatican conference, uh, where I was invited to speak, and the Pope Francis was in the audience, and I said to the audience there, the scientists and the religious leaders were together, 
And I said that as doctors, when they leave the university, uh, before they begin to practice, they take Hippocratic oath. And Hippocratic oath is first do no harm. Not only doctors, but scientists, politicians, economists, business leaders, all of us need to take this Hippocratic oath. And we need to start our work with a Hippocratic oath and say, first, I will do no harm. I will do no harm to nature. I'll do no harm to other people. And I will do no harm to myself. If we do no harm, then we have a complete freedom to act in the way we want to act. There's no other restrictions. Only one restriction we have to impose upon ourselves. Do no harm. If we can all take Hippocratic oath, that is the principle of nonviolence. And, and, uh, and we are not doing that. Only doctors take that Hippocratic oath, but nobody else. Why not? Everybody should take Hippocratic oath. Everybody should take oath of doing no harm. Uh, that's a really wonderful idea. And, and it's great that you say that. And we had that idea from ancient times that Ahimsa is the highest dharma. Uh, there's a reason why they've uh, considered since the ancient times, right? That nonviolence is the, the highest duty and responsibility of civil society to, to engage with and to, uh, to understand. And I think if events like this, but even future education can play a bigger role in understanding nonviolence. Uh, from an early age, not to step on the insect as a fun game or to engage in, uh, in, in such activities of harm from youth, uh, then, you know, we can imbibe that understanding within people from, from the earliest times. And, and that's something we at Godarmic are trying to do through uh, initiatives like this and efforts in every sphere of life, not just one with the uh, environment, but whether it's food waste, food poverty, people around us here in the UK in such a rich country who are going hung children going to school on empty stomachs or hungry or because uh, while food is being thrown in the bin uh, because of the way we are living it's all connected and uh, and because of that violence that we're causing so I, I completely agree with you absolutely absolutely I agree with you and I think Mahatma Gandhi said the same thing he said hunger is violence and poverty is violence. And exploitation of people is violence. Violence is not only when you hit somebody or you kill somebody, when you're exploiting somebody and social injustice is also violence. So if we have this inequality and if children are going to school hungry and if there is a, a injustice uh, in our society and if there is a, there's a poverty, uh, then that poverty is violence. And so we need to eliminate, if we want to practice non-violence, non-violence is not only a, a nice idea, it's a very, very socially, politically, economic, economically um, uh, vital idea. It's a kind of uh, an idea which is very practical and it should inform all our politics, economics, business uh, and, and social policy. And it's been wonderful speaking with you and understanding. Uh, I, I've certainly learned a lot from uh, what you've said today and, and find it really inspiring your energy and your passion and your, your kind heartedness. What would be your final message uh, to people at COP26, but also to wider society? It's all of the world leaders on the day that we are screening this event, Ahimsa and the Environment, uh, the World <clears throat> Leaders Summit is happening. My final message. My final message to people gathered in uh, Glasgow for COP26 is that the energy which comes from underworld, deep down under the earth, the coal and the oil, the dark energy coming out of the underworld. This dark energy is coming, and I call it energy from the hell. So don't use the energy from the hell because that energy from the hell will create hell on earth. Energy coming from the sun and the rain and the wind is coming from heaven. It's a light energy coming from the sky. 
And therefore, that energy is energy from he heaven. Use the energy from the heaven to create heaven on earth. Because we have used the energy from the hell, we have created hell on earth. If we use energy from heaven, we will create energy from heaven. So stop using energy from the hell and start using energy from the heaven, then we will have heaven on earth. That is my message to people in COP26 in Glasgow. Thank you so much uh, for everything you've said and for taking the time to speak with us. I hope to meet you in person very soon and uh, and work with you in any way possible. So thank you for everything that you do and for, for your messages here today. You are very welcome. Thank you.